436, the Star Spangled Banner, and we are going to sing all four verses in 436. <laughs>
We just thank you for that. We just ask now that you give us this this morning to speak to our hearts and just help us to, to listen and obey your word. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Folks, uh, if you'll remain standing, we have uh, three more patriotic hymns that we're going to sing. Okay. And we ask that you remain standing. If you cannot, then we do understand. All right, if you would go one page over to hymn 437, hymn 437, Battle Hymn of the Republic, and we will sing all four verses, hymn 437. Yeah. 
435. Hymn 435, O beautiful for spacious skies. And again, we will sing all four verses. Hymn 435. <laughs> Um, 
And uh, all right, we're gonna worship the Lord with His tithe and our offering. Oh, that's right. We have anniversaries today. We have Sister Garlene. Uh, today is her wedding anniversary, and we have. And the Tablers, today is their anniversary, and Nathaniel is celebrating his anniversary like very few people do. He's homesick in bed. Uh, just anticipation. No, 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 no. He was so. Never mind. So, uh, happy anniversary uh, to Sister Garlene and Frank, and then. Valerie and Nathaniel, may God bless you with double your years. Well, y'all, you know, times ten. <laughs> so, all right, now we'll receive the offering. Can I have an usher or two? Uh, look at these good-looking men who have volunteered to <laughs> receive the offering. Yeah. All right, Brother Jim, if you'll pray for the offering, sir. You have on the Lord God, we come to thank you for this day and blessings of this day, Lord, for this country that we have so generously been uh, blessed with. Yes. We ask that you comfort the families of those loved ones that, that gave the ultimate price. Yes. In order that uh, we'll always uh, keep them in our prayers and our children. We ask now for the bless this offering that we be further the cause and get the word out to the lost and dying world. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
today when the weak confound the mighty. Uh, I think everybody here has heard my testimony about when uh, God, God called me to preach and my reaction uh, was to run. I, I was going to be like Jonah, right? And uh, I was such a, a young Christian and very ignorant about uh, God and the Bible and spiritual things. I genuinely went to my pastor and said, listen, God's called me to preach and I can't do it. You need to get me out of it. Because I thought that's how it worked. I mean, because I've been under his preaching before I got saved and since I had gotten saved. And I knew that God was in touch with him. Because so many times, I was the only one he preached to. Right? <laughs> house full of people and he was preaching directly to me and uh, I, I knew that he wasn't reading my mail because I wasn't getting any right but God is one who was leading him on what to preach and so I went to him and said listen God called me to preach and I can't do it and he said well go read 1 Corinthians 
chapter 1. And I'm going to read that for you, starting with verse 25. He, he said, this is, you need to go read this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 25. says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Right? You take, God's foolishness is wiser than the wisest man. And the weaknesses of God is stronger than man. Verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, have it not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. He told me, he said, Stacy, go read this verse. And I got to tell you, my first reaction was, so that's what he thinks of me. <laughs> right? I already knew that he wasn't a fan. Right? And uh, he gives this to me, and I read it, and I'm like, so that, that's how you see me. And that, that's how I was, whether he saw me like that or not. Uh, I, I, was, I was not, in man's view, I was not the best choice. You know, I was such an introvert, right? And that's really not accurate. I was just scared of people. And uh, I'm dyslexic. And my dyslexia manifests in, in my reading uh, as well as math. Shows God's humor when he put me into banking, right? Uh, and I am what God chooses. Because I wasn't bubbling over with all kinds of ability, right? I didn't have all the natural abilities that one would think of, right? I, I, I wasn't charismatic when I spoke to people and so forth. And God said, Stacy, I, you are what I want to use because you can't do it. You can't do it in, in the energy of your flesh. Son, you just don't have it. So if you're going to be used of me, you have to yield yourself. You know, and I wasn't the first one ever to be in that predicament. Now we're going to be back in Exodus chapter 2. And we're going to look at somebody that we're all familiar with. And uh, we're going to look at a man called Moses. Right? We know the story about Moses. Moses was born in a time when he was to be put to death. Right? There was a decree made that any, any male child of the Jews was to be put to death. Boom. No questions. No. It didn't matter. Right? The, uh, the midwives were told, you're a killer. I couldn't imagine what it was to be a midwife back then. Well, Moses' mama was a rebel. She had her baby and she hid him as long as she could in the house. And then she knew she couldn't hide him, so she built a, an ark of bulrushes and she put sap inside and out, made it waterproof, and she put her baby in that little ark and put it in the Nile. And I guarantee you she was praying. Right? And then... As God would have it, Pharaoh's daughter found the baby. And she said, I, I'm going to raise this baby as my own. And I love how God arranged for Pharaoh's daughter to pay Moses' mother to raise him for her. <laughs> I love it. Just like God. Right? Well, we're going to pick up, uh, look at verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to them, that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee prince and judge over us? 
Intendest thou to kill me as thou kill, killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. So Moses, he was raised in Pharaoh's house, but he never lost his identity. He knew that he was a Hebrew. And he went out and he saw a fellow Hebrew being abused and he killed the abuser. Then he saw two Hebrews arguing and he said, and he didn't understand it, right? Because they were family. And, and they said, what? You, you going to kill me too? See, he, he forgot that there was another person at that first instant, right? When he killed the Egyptian was the other Hebrew. So there was a witness. So, uh, so Moses gets afraid. Pharaoh hears of it. And Pharaoh sought to kill Moses. Right? His adopted grandson. So Moses puts it in high gear and he flees. <laughs> right? He flees. And then, let's see. He went and, and he fled and he met a man who had sheep. And he hired Moses to be a shepherd. Look at verse 21. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses Zipporah, his daughter. So Moses, not only did he get a job, he got a wife. Right? And, and so he's there. And it says in verse 21 that he was content. That's a great place to be, folks. Is content. Right? But then he spent time uh, taking care of his father in law's flock. Time for dreaming had passed. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father in law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. And came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Could you imagine? He's out there tending to his business, taking care of the, the flock. And all of a sudden, this bush starts to burn. Well, it doesn't burn. There's a fire on the bush, but the bush isn't consumed. That sort of staggered Moses. He's like, what? Right? That would have staggered me. I don't know about you. But I would, I would have done a double take. Moses did. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. So he's got to investigate and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw uh, not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place where I may stand. Uh, thou standest is holy ground. Wait a second. This bush is burning. And he's like, what? I'm going to check it out. And he starts going to investigate. And then God speaks to him out of the bush. I guarantee you that staggered him. And God said, Moses, don't get too close. You need to take your shoes off. Because this is holy ground. And so we see that that he comes face to face with God. And he doesn't know what to think of it. Look at verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Oh, yes. I ought to have been hiding my face. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. 
and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. <laughs> Moses is back there, right? He's been on the backside of the desert. He's been a uh, shepherd now for 40 years, right? It's uh, He was 40 years in Egypt, and about the age of 40, he fled. And then he's been with his father-in-law for about 40 years, very content. And then God enters in the picture. And God says, Moses, I've seen the affliction of my people. Moses is very familiar, right? Because Moses, why did he flee? Because he saw the affliction of, of God's people, and he intervened in the flesh. Now, don't get mad at Moses. You'd have done the same thing. Y'all looking at me like you wouldn't have. You know you would have. You saw your people being abused. <clears throat> you wouldn't have said, I need to pray about it. Okay. Yep. Okay. I wouldn't have. All right, so, verse 8, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of Can the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the uh, Hiv Hivites and the Jebusites. Right? Moses is probably like, that's good. That's good news. They're going to get delivered. I tried. And he, I guarantee you, he's excited with what God's telling him. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the, Egypt, the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses was on board up until that point. God says, Moses, guess what? I'm going to deliver the people. And Moses was probably like, all right, praise the Lord, let's do it. And then God said, uh, but Moses, you're going to be the feet on the ground. I'm going to send you. You know what? God still calls his people today. He still calls his people today to do things. Right? What was uh, Moses' reaction? All right, let's go. All right. I'm game. Verse 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Right? So here he is. God says... I've heard. And guess what? I'm going to deliver them. And seriously, I think Moses was on board with that idea until God says, Moses, <clears throat> I'm sending you. And then we see Moses' reaction. Right? He starts with the excuses. Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? He's like, <laughs> Seriously? I know what's going through his mind. Yeah, yeah, God. Pharaoh wants me dead, do you remember? And now you want me to walk into his presence and deliver it? I'm good. No, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. There's, there's just no way. <clears throat> Verse 12. And he said, certainly I will be with thee, and this, this shall be a token unto thee <coughs> that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, Ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And I'm sure Moses was like, God, you didn't hear what I said. You're just telling me, yeah, yeah, I'll be with you. So verse 13, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? How did they like it the last time Moses interfered? The one guy threw him under the bus. What, you're going to kill me too? And Moses is like, I go to them, they're not going to believe me. God said in verse 14, And God said unto Moses, I am 
that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am his you. Now, look at chapter 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. They're going to say that because you haven't appeared unto them. So they're not going to believe me, God. Right? So he's throwing out excuse after excuse. He says, look, I don't look, have anything to say. They're going to believe. Now he's saying, all right, I say what you want me to say. They're not going to believe me. They're going to say, God's not appeared unto you. Look at his next excuse, chapter 4 and verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and slow and of a slow tongue. Right? That's sort of like what I was trying to tell Pastor Welch. <laughs> I'm not of eloquent speech. Right? I... I, I no, it's, it, it's, it's not good. It, it's just, you know, and, and I really thought that Pastor Welch could go to God and say, not this one. They're, they're better able to serve you. I, I really thought he could do that, right? And then he, he told me, you know, to read those verses in 1 Corinthians. But now the bottom line for Moses is he didn't want to do this. Now, humanly speaking, I think some of his arguments were maybe valid. Right? I think it was reasonable for him to be afraid to go to Pharaoh, who wants him dead, and say, hey, God sent me, let his people go. I think that was a reasonable fear, humanly speaking. And then, God is tasking him with something he's never been asked to do before. Nobody had ever been asked to do. And he was like, I have no idea how to do this. What am I going to say? And, and regardless of what I say, they're not going to believe me. And then when I speak, Lord, I am of slow speech. My, my tongue doesn't work right when I try to talk. I don't think that Moses, you know, he didn't have what they would call today the buy-in. He didn't buy into it. I think he liked the idea of the children of Israel being rescued as long as somebody else did it. Lord, don't you have some Marines somewhere you can send in? Can I ask you a question? What does God given you to do that you're afraid to do. You said, well, God's not called on me to, to deliver any people. But that's not the only thing. See, Satan likes, Satan was having a field day with Moses. Satan knew what God would do with Moses. He knew better than Moses did, and he didn't want it done. Maybe, maybe Satan was whispering in Moses' ears, this is why you can't do it. This is why you'll never amount to anything, Moses. Is Satan whispering in your ear? You say, well, I'm a child of God. Satan can't touch me. Hang on there, man. He is the prince and ruler of the air. He can't touch your soul. But that doesn't mean he won't be whispering in your ear. You ever wonder, why do I have these thoughts? Why do I have these negative thoughts? Why am I thinking like this? See, Satan cannot read your thoughts, but he can plant thoughts in your mind. And he puts them there for you to pick up and run with and make your own. I heard a preacher say once, you know, you can't control the thoughts that Satan puts in your mind. No more than you can control a bird landing on your head. 
But you can control whether or not that bird makes a nest on your head. And that's given place to those thoughts that Satan plants there. Do you have negative self-talk? Man, I'm such an idiot. Man, you know, I knew I'd blow it. Man, I can't do anything right. God will never use me. Or, I think one of Satan's favorites, God can't use me. Hmm. See, we need to make sure that We listen to God. How do we listen to God? Well, the, the first thing, and don't know where I'm going to go, is God's Word. This is the main way that He speaks to us. So we need to spend time daily in His Word. See, God will use you. God wants to use you. And God can use you where you are like nobody else. One caveat. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, then he's not going to use you. God will not use a dirty vessel. No matter how much talent God has endowed you with, if you're not right with him, he won't use you. We have to remember, we'll never have God over a barrel. Hey God, look at, look at me. Like they used to say, I'm all that in a bag of chips. Right? God, you got to use me. God doesn't have to use anybody. <laughs> My Bible says that if all of mankind were to shut up, that the rocks would cry out. Right? So nobody is going to hold God over a barrel and say, you're just going to have to let that sin go if you want to use me. Mm -hmm. But if, you're, if, if, if you don't have unconfessed sin, uh, if your sin account, if you will, is up to date and you're right with God, He will use you. He will use you in ways that you can't imagine. Moses was looking at the task and he saw what God wanted him to do. And Moses immediately came up with at least four excuses why he couldn't do it. And I think a couple of them, I might have been like, you know what, Moses, you're right. God, he's right. Look at him. It's hard for me to understand him sometimes. But guess what? Those excuses didn't fly with God. Go back to chapter 3. And we looked, we already looked at verse 12. I got out of sync a little bit. In verse 11, Moses, uh, again, Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Again, he said, Who am I? I can't do it. Verse 12, and he said, Certainly I will be with thee. God is saying, Moses, i got a job for you to do. Moses says, hey, God, who am I to do it? And God said, Moses, you're not going alone. And that's something you have to remember. When God gives you something to do, he's not sending you out on your own to do it. <clears throat> he said to Moses, I will be with thee. <clears throat> and then he goes into a little bit more. And he's like... But God, verse 13, he said, but what shall I say? And again, we looked at verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. <coughs> Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. I am. There's only one that can say I am. And that's the eternal God. You can't say, I am. You say, oh, yes, I can. I am. <clears throat> By the time you say it, it's not accurate. You'd have to say, I were. Or I was. God's the only one that can say, I am. Because he still is. He doesn't change. He is eternal. 
Excuse me. Chapter 4. <clears throat> Moses said that uh, they'll not believe me. <clears throat> they'll say the word <clears throat> hath not appeared unto thee. Excuse me. <clears throat> Frog trying to escape. <clears throat> chapter 4 verse 1 Moses said they're not going to hearken unto me they're not going to believe me they're going to say God didn't appear unto you God responds in verse 2 and the Lord said unto him what is that in thy hand and he said a rod and he said cast it on the ground and he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent <laughs> and Moses fled <laughs> from before it right I know some folks in this room yeah, y'all would have fled too, right? You got this rod, you throw it on the ground, it becomes a certain feet don't fail me now. I'm out of here, right? That's what Moses did. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thy hand and take it up by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. God says, Moses, they're, yeah, they're going to say that I didn't appear before you, but listen, I'm going to do miracles through you that will validate what you're telling them. Listen, God, if God told you to do something and you're hesitant for whatever excuse Satan provides you with, remember, <clears throat> God's going to go with you. He's not going to send you alone. He cares about the task more than you do. Right? God cares more about all souls than you do. <clears throat> so he's going to be with you. He's going to, he's not just going to send. It's like, I remember years ago in the bus ministry, I heard somebody say, parents don't send your kids to Sunday school or to church. Take. Take them. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. But what about what he said Later, he said, God, I, <clears throat> in verse 10, his last excuse, he said, I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. God, I, I can't go because I'm slow of speech, and, and when I finally do speak, my tongue doesn't always work. You know, years ago, I was witnessing to somebody that I worked with, and and they looked at me and they said, Stacy, you're such a simpleton. And they didn't mean it as a compliment. And I said, well, thank you. And they were like, see, you're so dumb, you don't know you're being insulted. And then I took them to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and said, I'm just what God wants to use. Right? You think maybe you can't do it. Maybe you think you can't do it because other people have told you you can't do it. Maybe you've had other people feeding that soundtrack in your head saying, you'll never amount to anything. You can't do anything. You know, you can't believe them. They don't know. God said to Moses, verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb? or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Moses, who made your mouth? Right? You think, you think I don't know what's going on with your mouth? Who made it? Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. See, when he, was, when he said, I am slow of speech, he was talking about mentally. Mentally, right? And God said, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to be with your mouth and I'm going to teach you what to say. Right? The world looks at somebody and they assess them outwardly. Man, they've got the looks, they've got the charisma. Man, they got all that going for them. You know what God says to that? And I'll try to be accurate 
with with the Greek and everything. <laughs> See, that's what man does. Man says, this, this is why you can't do it. But this is why he can't. We have a biblical example, don't we? Of how man looked on the outside. Remember Israel? You remember their first king? Why they chose Saul to be king? Because he was a great humanitarian? No. Because he had compassion? Mm -mm. It's because he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And what better image for a king? He goes out in front of the army and they see the big king. They're going to, hey, can we negotiate? Right? That's how their mind works. The Bible tells us that God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. See, when you have people around you that, that tell you you're not useful, that you're not worthy, that you can't do anything, first thing you need to do is get those people out of your life. See, in my life, I want Christians that will make me a better Christian. I want Christians that will help me to grow spiritually. I want to surround myself with, with Christians that I can go to and say, listen, God's laid this burden on my heart. This is what I think the Lord would have me to do. And I need you to pray. Right? Because it's not uh, me that's going to do it anyway. And today we talk a lot about ability. You know what the, the number one ability God is looking for? availability. Are you available to God? Maybe you're sitting back and you're saying, I wish God would use me. Well, what are you doing for God now? Does God know that he can use you? Right? Or are you sitting back and saying, well, as God moves me, I, I heard an evangelist say years ago, he was uh, playing baseball for uh, the school, for his high school. And he was out in the outfield, and a fellow got up to bat, and he hit it. And he just stood there watching the ball go. And when he came in, his coach chewed him out. He said, listen, you weren't moving. When that bat cracks, you move. He said, but what if I go the wrong direction? And the coach said, listen, you need to learn this now. It's easier to change somebody's direction that's moving than to start moving from a dead stop. You say, how's that apply? Listen, you want to serve God? Then you get busy serving God where you are. If God's laid something on your heart, then you need to first make sure it's God. Make sure it's God. Right? There have been times when Miss Beth and I first got married and we moved to Georgia and we were in Bible college, I, I saw a ministry and I was like, that's it. That's what we need to do. Because it was something that I could have gotten into. And uh, <laughs> it was, um, well, I can't even tell you the name of the ministry now, but it was uh, living on board a ship and going from country to country. And I love the water. I tried talking Miss Beth into us living on a houseboat. Closest we got was a waterbed. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we got rid of that and haven't had one since, so that just gives you an idea. But I could, I could have gotten into that ministry, you know, working on a ship, living on a ship, going to different countries and evangelizing. But that's not what God wanted us to do. Stacy would have been, "Woo, let's go!" Right. So you got to make sure that whatever you think God wants you to do, it is God. That wants you to do it. You say, how do you know? First, spending time in God's word. And then time in prayer. And then seeking godly counsel. Godly counsel. Can I emphasize that enough? Godly counsel. Because I guarantee you, there are some folks I could have gone to and said, hey, check this out. And they've been like, when do we sign up? Right? It wasn't God's will, but they would have been willing to go with me. See, God will use you if you'll yield. Moses yielded. 
And let me close with his achievement. Go to chapter 12 of Exodus. Chapter 12, verse 31, talking about Pharaoh. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get ye forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Now we, we skipped a bunch in there. But Moses did what God had him to do. And at the end, and there were a couple times that uh, Pharaoh offered compromise. And we have to be careful. When we're serving God, Satan will offer compromise. And it will look like you're being obedient, but you're not. Moses stayed in there. And so again, verse 31, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron by night and said... Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Another way we might say it down here, get! Get out of here. I've had enough. Get your people, get all your stuff, and go. And we read later that they paid them to leave. They said, not only do we want you to go, here, take, here. Take this with you, just go. See, Pharaoh, the first time Moses showed up, Pharaoh laughed in Moses' face. Right? They looked at him, who are you? Who is, what, you? Right? It's sort of like the British and the colonial army. The British scoffed. Look at these farmers. They're, they're better suited behind a plow than a rifle. But when we yield to God, He can make the weak to confound the mighty. We have to do it in His strength. And if we're obedient, we'll get the victory through Christ. Let's stand on our feet, if you will. Heads bowed, eyes closed, Christians praying. Imitation is very simple. The, the start of victory is coming to Christ uh, for salvation. Again, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. As we're here this morning, if there's one here that's not 100% sure of your salvation, you have to get that settled today. That is the starting point of doing anything for God. Would you lift your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not 100% sure. Folks online, if you're not sure, send me a message. Let me know. Communicate with me. And I will get with you and show you from God's Word how you can know. If we have our salvation settled, is there something that God wants us to do that we're struggling with? Maybe you say, I'm not struggling with it. I'm just not going to do it. Well, hopefully we desire to please Him. Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence, we truly are thankful for the opportunity that we've had to gather together in your house. And I ask that you would continue to work in the hearts of those that are either here or watching online. And that we would be able to be obedient to leading the Holy Spirit. And that we would have the boldness to follow you. Help us to be mindful of your presence. Lord, just continue to work. All right, Mr.